book review I came across in the New York Times prompted me to immediately call my mother. When I called my mother and shared the title of the book, Oscar Schindler, I asked her, who is he, if she knew him, and what connection, if any, he had to her. It was at that moment that I learned that she and her two sisters were placed on a list and ultimately saved. They were among 1,200 survivors chosen to Schindler's List. As you heard, my name is Lola Hahn. I am first generation American and a child of Holocaust survivors from Poland. I will focus on a sequence of my most profound experiences under the German occupation. It's very hard for me to talk about the brutalities, violence, and the unhuman prosecution against us. And I don't think words can explain it. However, we can't let this crime to be forgotten. We have to keep remembering with each generation so we can guard the world against another Hitler. I took big chances to go to see my mom I had to go see my mother. Uh, I, I didn't tell her about my condition. I didn't want her to worry, but I, I am sure she knew. My sisters were in a transport to be already on, on their way. And I got them out in the last minute. This was the, almost the end of the Camp Plashov and they were just, the Russians were coming closer, and they were liquidating the Camp Plashov. Accidentally, I saw it was just accident because I was on the third floor of the villa, just happening to dust the window, when I saw a lot of women marching down to the entrance of the, of the, of the camp with white kerchief on. And I came running to the kitchen and I said to my friend Lena, I said, people are leaving the camp. My sisters must be there, might be there. I'm going. She said, don't go, don't go. I said, I'm going. I am going. And I grabbed the white kerchief running down. I was lucky to get him out. But he found out about it. I never lost faith in God, but I can't get over the fact that God had permitted this crime, and I still don't have the answer. The 63 years old, sharing some of her most profound experiences during the Holocaust. She presented this at a program in November 1988 at her synagogue, the Suburban Temple in Wontaw, New York, marking 50 years since Kristallnacht. This picture was the last picture with my grandmother Lola and her three daughters taken sometime in 1937 on the side of the famous Babel Royal Castle in Krakow, Poland, their hometown. It was one of three pictures that my Aunt Helen was able to save. My mother, Sidel, Sidonia, on the right, was 17. Betty, Bronya, her middle sister on the left, was 15. And Helen, Helena, the youngest sister, standing behind their mother, was 12. The Sternlick sisters, as they were referred to by their maiden name, had loving parents and a happy and secure childhood. Their residence on the outskirts of Krakow was where their family found security and did not experience discrimination or anti-Semitic expressions. It wasn't until the children were a little older that my grandparents chose to move into the city of Krakow where they became uneasy about letting my mother out in the evenings because of the individuals who were attacking Jews. The family was modern in their daily life and observant in following all traditions of Judaism. 
Polish was spoken in and out of their home. Yiddish was only spoken by their maternal grandparents who lived nearby, so the girls did have an understanding of the language. After my aunt finished her public school studies, her plan was to continue on to a vocational school where both my mother and other aunt had been attending. Unfortunately, their continued education was cut short when Germany invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. My grandfather, Simon Sternlich, was a man of integrity and kindness. His attention to his family was always with devotion and good humor. He served in World War I in the Polish Army and shared stories of his successes during his service with his daughters, which his daughters loved hearing. He earned a comfortable living running a metal shop in ironwork and providing locksmith services and treated his employees with fairness and generosity. In November 1939, restrictive edicts were issued and Jewish businesses were taken away. My grandfather was still allowed to keep his shop, working for the Gestapo, which gave him a sense of security of being a needed worker. My grandmother Lola, who I was named after, was a beautiful woman, woman who filled their home with good cheer, playfulness, and lots of songs. She was a good cook and regularly contributed meals for sick people in a sanitarium. My grandmother was a passionate person who had a strong commitment to social justice. These two pictures of my grandparents were the other two that my Aunt Helen was able to say. By March 20th, 1941, the whole family was forced to relocate to the Krakow ghetto in Poland. They were told to pack only what they could carry and must relocate there within two days without knowing what they would have to face and what would be a necessity. The ghetto was not set up in the historical Jewish quarter of Kashmir's area where they had lived in, but on Podgorz, on the right bank of the Vistula River. They had to walk across the bridge to the ghetto, searching for a place in a house already filled to capacity. The ghetto territory covered 15 streets, consisting of 320 houses with 3,167 rooms. A wall in the style of Jewish tombstones and a wooden fence surrounded the ghetto. All windows and doors overlooking or leading to the Aryan side were closed with bricks and there were four guarded entrances. Most of the houses were dilapidated. Before the war, there were 3,000 inhabitants, but now more than 15,000 people were crowded together. Life in the ghetto was one of hunger, disease, and overcrowding. My grandparents and their children managed to find strength in the fact that as long as they were all together, they could endure. In September 1942, my grandfather was taken by the Nazis from their home never to be seen again. My grandmother, along with her three daughters, remained in the Krakow ghetto and moved to the labor camp, Camp Plaschow in Krakow, after the ghetto was liquidated in early 1943. Camp Plaschow was later constructed to a concentration camp. Unfortunately, my grandmother fell ill and passed away in late spring 1944. On the third day of their internment at Plaschow, Helen was washing windows in the barracks when Get, the camp commandant, entered the room. He commented on the exemplary job she was doing. 
and ordered her to go to his villa, which was on the grounds of the camp, to work as a housemaid. As his maid, she lived in the cellar of his villa with another woman who also served as his maid. My aunt observed Commandant Gett often shooting prisoners from the balcony of his villa, and she saw him murder several people and order the deaths of many more. He also beat her. My aunt received small kindnesses from a civilian, a frequent happy visitor to the villa, who she wasn't sure she could trust because he seemed so friendly with Commandant Gett. She recalled him saying to her, you're going to be all right. Remember the people in Egypt? They were freed, so you will be too. That man was war profiteer Oscar Schindler. Who was Oscar Schindler? Oscar Schindler was a man who enjoyed fast living. He liked to race motorcycles and his wife thought he drank too much. Schindler joined the Nazi party to make money. After the Nazi invasion of Poland, Schindler made plans to start a business there and become rich. Instead, he saw the plight of the Polish Jews, the forced labor, the Nazi brutality, and the executions. In his mission to save Jews, Oscar Schindler lost his fortune and risked his own life. He could not let these things happen without trying to make a difference. In 1939, Schindler acquired an enamelware factory in Krakow, Poland, which employed at the factory's peak in 1944 about 1,750 workers, of whom 1,000 were Jews. His Nazi connections helped him protect his Jewish workers from deportation and death in the Nazi concentration camps. As time went on, Schindler had to give Nazi officials even larger bribes and gifts of luxury items, obtainable only on the black market to keep his workers safe. He continued to bribe the officials until the end of World War II in Europe in May, 1945 by which time he had spent his entire fortune on bribes and black market purchases of supplies for his workers. To quote one of the survivors, he was life and our future. He was God. In my Aunt Helen's position, she had many opportunities to speak with Oscar Schindler when he made these visits to the villa. At one of his last visits, Oscar Schindler told her, you are coming with me. He also asked if she had any family at Camp Lachau, and ultimately all three sisters were placed on Schindler's list. My mother and her sisters were among 300 women who spent three weeks in the Auschwitz concentration camp. And when they arrived at the camp, the men and the women were separated and they were asked to take off all their clothes and each group were thrown into a large room. And at that point, they had already heard rumors about what could happen in that large room. It was a question as to whether it would be life or death. And uh, at the, on the ceiling of, of these rooms were these shower heads and they would either emit water or gas. My mother and her two sisters were standing together and all of a sudden, the water came out of the shower heads. And my mother and my mother's other sister, Bronya, were, I guess, 
for lack of a better word, they were elated. But my Aunt Helen stood there with no expression on her face, with her mouth closed. And at one point went like this. And, um, and the reason that her mouth was closed was that she had three tiny pictures. The two of my grandfather and grandmother and the one of she with their mother and her sisters. Following the brief time in Auschwitz, they went on to Schindler's factory in Grenlitz, Czechoslovakia, where they spent seven months before being liberated on May 6, 1945. All three sisters were able to move forward in life, finding meaning and purpose, showing compassion, strength, and love. In January 1949, they arrived in America and had reinvented themselves, devoting considerable energy to the present and future. They did not dwell on the past, and my sister, cousins, and I did not ask too many questions. Whatever memories they had harbored must have been very painful. My mother and her sisters didn't keep these truths from us about their lives during the Holocaust intentionally. They were simply pieces of a former life they chose to leave behind. They also felt they were protecting the children by not telling us their harrowing tale. It was important to them that their children lead normal lives and not hate or be afraid. 26 years ago, the movie Schindler's List was released based on the book that was published in 1982. Like million of other people, millions of other people, my aunt saw the movie. To quote my Aunt Helen, unlike most other people, she saw in it herself, her family and friends that she will never see again. Five and a half years of my life are portrayed in this movie. My aunt is grateful to Steven Spielberg for bringing this movie to life. Schindler's List changed the lives for many Holocaust survivors, as well as for Steven Spielberg. It provided them with a platform where they finally felt they could share their stories with others. As Spielberg was finishing up the film, he began to form the idea of what later became the University of Southern California Shoah Foundation as a way to continue to record the stories of Holocaust survivors. He started it on the premises of Universal Studios prior to it moving to the university campus. It became a 20-year project where nearly 52,000 Holocaust survivors' testimonies were collected and preserved, and later, survivors of other genocides were added. Today, it continues to expand its educational outreach to ensure that the survivors and their testimonies serve as teachers for future generations. Testimony from the Rwandan Tutsi genocide and the Nanying massacre have been added to its visual history archive, an Armenian and Cambodian collections will be added soon as well. In December 2018, at the 25th anniversary and release of a special edition of Shinla's List, Spielberg shared the following. It is difficult to believe that it's been 25 years since Schindler's List first arrived in theaters. The true stories of the magnitude and tragedy of the Holocaust are ones that must never be forgotten. And the film's lessons about the critical importance of countering hatred continue to reverberate today. 
my Aunt Helen took on a mission to share her story and the story of her people to ensure that we remember the Holocaust and educate the citizens of every country about its timeless lessons so that no one will ever forget about the lives lost in the Holocaust. To quote my aunt's exact words, the Holocaust is meaningful, not only for survivors and their families, but for all humanity. My aunt, oh, I'm sorry, education is critical as a means of ensuring that genocide does not occur again. Or when it does, the world will not stand silently by as innocents are slaughtered. This is not a Jewish issue, but one that has great importance for all faith communities. My aunt started sharing her story in early 1944 after the movie was released. She spoke at many schools, adult group events, churches and synagogues, predominantly in New York, New Jersey, and Florida. She also produced several testimonials that are housed at different Holocaust institutions, including the one for the Shoah Foundation. The four video segments you heard at the beginning of my presentation came from a testimonial that I was unfamiliar with. Recently, I was doing research on the Holocaust Museum Archive website concerning my aunt, and this link happened to appear. When I mentioned it to one of my cousins, she had no idea it had been donated by the synagogue they had attended. She had forgotten that her mother presented that testimonial and that it occurred prior to the release of the movie. It was not easy for my aunt to delve into her tra traumatic memories, but she felt that she needed to find the courage necessary to share her experiences and honor the people who were not able to speak. She wanted to remind people the power we all possess to make a choice, to do good and help others as Oscar Schindler did or to ignore, to hate, and destroy. She explained why she must speak for those who could not, that she, that she could not let the fact that she had survived simply be the end. In February 2016, the United Holocaust Memorial Museum honored my Aunt Helen with its National Leadership Award, which meant to her that her message was hitting home. To quote my Aunt Helen, we were blessed to have been saved by a good man, Oscar Schindler, who saved the lives of Jews because he found his humanity and it was the right thing to do. On Schindler's tombstone, there is a cross and written in Hebrew, it says, he who saves a single soul saves the entire world. As she always said to me, we must raise awareness and work toward a better world. It is urgent that the next generation give meaning to never again. Only education about the truth of Holocaust history can do that. Many of the survivors speaking out today children during the Holocaust. And as their voices, like the voices of older generations, diminish, it is up to all of us to carry on their testimony about the destructive power of hate. On December 20th, 2018, unfortunately, my aunt passed away at the age of 93 and now more than ever, it is my responsibility, along with her children and grandchildren, to continue her legacy. This is a commitment we must all embrace. Thank you. I would also like to thank DZD, Karen, Adi, and Ariel 
for their support enabling me to share my family's story. And I also want to thank everyone who joined me tonight, friends and family from near and far. Thank you again. Um, of course, a special thank you to um, Lola. I lost you on my screen, but a special thank you for you um, for being here tonight for um, uh, virtual claps. Everybody's on mute, but I hope you can see them um, for sharing for sharing your story, the story of your family with our community. I want you to know how much we all appreciate um, you, your efforts, and and being here in virtually with us. We promise that once we are able to actually meet with you again together, we will present you with this actual certificate that we did. <laughs> we did print out, we did, we did put it together, and once we are able to meet, we will give it to you. Um, it's an appreciation for your kind efforts um, in support of the Zikaon Basalon um, program. We were honored to have you here with us tonight um, for this meaningful event. Um, we thank you. We thank all of you. Um, good night from the Baltimore Zionist District um, to the Baltimore community and beyond. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Lola.